My name is John Hammond. I was born on March 14, 1928. What follows is a record of certain events in which I took part between the years 1980 and 1997 on an island I will call Site B. Site B was not to be a theme park, but a research station. This was where we did the real work. Isla Sauna. Costa Rica lay to the east, a quiet neighbor, to the west, open water, and the shipping lanes of the Pacific. By 1989, international genetic technologies had succeeded in their design to genetically recreate the dinosaurs. It was an unprecedented accomplishment, the pinnacle of 20th century science, a work to rank with the achievements of Galileo or Einstein. But it was not all so easy or so simple as it appeared. On seldom hears the true history of such events. What happened at the place where the world changed, how it began, what were the reasons, what was the cost. A Nobel Prize or a financial empire waits somewhere in a darkened room, in a dirty, derelict building, somewhere in the Pacific. mysterious John Hammond, shady investor, multimillionaire, <laughs> jovial mad scientist. Uh, I left home at 15 with a rather romantic idea of seeking my fortune. I remember, I remember the train ride south in my best clothes, eating an apple. The entire world before me. I had neither fortune, nor education, nor connections. Nothing. It was the flowering of an ambition born 50 years ago. When I was little, I dreamed of a time when the entire world was covered by an ancient forest. Great hunters stalked in the cool darkness among silent, huge columnar trees, oaks and sequoias. Fifty years struggle come to this. An idea brought me awake one morning in New York. I almost didn't write it down. What if a mosquito sucked the blood of a dinosaur? The insect is then covered in tree sap, which, over the millennia, becomes amber. The insect is preserved perfectly. But you see, and here's the clever part, wouldn't the dinosaur blood be preserved as well? The blood holds DNA, a tiny spiral of genetic code. Sunlight angled down through the dusty air in Norman's office and I leaned against a solid oak table as I outlined my plans for international genetic technologies. The first task was genetic recovery. Acquiring Jurassic or Cretaceous amber, extracting preserved DNA and reassembling the complete sequences. Bringing it up the well, we called it. If we succeeded, the InGen technology would be historic. We were planning to conquer time's power over life, its power to extinguish and erase. It would change all our lives as profoundly, as irrevocably, as the atomic bomb.
1981. I stumbled out of the helicopter, already beginning to sweat, and looked around at the lush forest. I smelled of wet leaves, damp earth, rotting wood. The sky at noon was like nothing in Europe. Hot, tropical, and new world. Cameras and seismic instruments in yellow crates. They set them in the dust as the helicopter rose. A few weeks after we landed, we went to the summit to put up a satellite link. We went by helicopter. I spared no expense, permitted no failures. High-speed uplink, <laughs> state-of-the-art. The air grew moist and heavy. Young technicians scrambled to set up the dish as the wind howled. We took a short cut south to reach the site, west along the stream until a tall tree shows itself with a cluster of boulders at its base, then walk northward until the path appears. As I journeyed south along the coast, there was an utter silence. Far away, I could hear a jeep engine idling. The jungle canopy hung over us. The two guards attended to the wheel, and just for an instant, I stood alone, unprotected in the Jurassic wilderness. On the plain, the heat was extraordinary, like a solid wall. I stood on the lip of the cliff, I felt the air currents around me, the wind blowing my hair. I heard a single tree rustle. Nineteen eighty two. Robert Muldoon I already knew. Dennis Nedry I found in Cambridge, and despite his idiosyncrasies, he was years ahead of his competition. Dennis fancied himself quite the hacker. He had his own locks for his doors. His office decorations were quite outside company regulations. Henry Wu was an only child from Ohio, a prodigy. He gained early attention for his undergraduate thesis at MIT. Dr. Wu's laboratory was a mystery to me. I never finished my schooling. I had a child's idea of science, test tubes, explosions, <laughs> and miracles. The main laboratory and administrative buildings, this was where we made our discovery, where the real magic trick happened. When they come to dig up our secrets, they'll come here. It was strange to move from the field, the hot sun, dirt on one's trouser cuffs, into the cool, sterile darkness of the lab, the sharp tang of the preservative chemicals, the coolness and hush of the sterile chamber, the daily ritual of decontamination. The centrifuge whirred night and day. 
The clear fluid held a cloudy layer of DNA strands. Three Cray XMPs move more data faster than any computer center in the Americas. Diagnostics, communications, security, all ran through the computer. Accordingly, computer security was paramount the tightest on the island. Site B was fully centralized and computer controlled. The same design that became the Achilles heel of Jurassic Park. I still believe Nidri left himself a back door, something about the hobbits or God knows what. Left to itself, the facility reverts to minimal power, chiefly battery-powered security systems. It can sustain itself almost indefinitely. We worked long into the night, feeling at times as if the whole of the earth had fallen away outside, leaving only the darkness, the work, the endless questioning into the past. In a quiet locked room, the extinction of species, the history of life on earth is being methodically reversed. The slow alchemy of genetic replication. It was in the last days of genetic recovery, and at this point, nothing was certain. Was the DNA there? Could we bring it back up the well? It was 3 a.m. The room was strewn with soda cans, and for the hundredth time, we ran the extraction sequence. As Ned retyped, the world seemed to hold its breath, and for a moment we stood at the turning point between two great planetary eras. I began to have my first inkling of the seriousness of our work, how deep the well was. All my life I'd waited for something great, something extraordinary. And then it opened up. The code read true. The barrier of time for, for an instant opened. Nedry and I stared into the monitor. Dennis. What are we looking at here? The greatest discovery of the 20th century. By 1983, we held 13 new patents. In 11 months, Site B became the most powerful genetics facility in the world. November 1983, test fertilization of an artificial ovum. My hand shook as I held the tiny eye drop. One drop, two drops, there. It looked like a ghost or a puff of smoke. The genie was out of the bottle. The raptor took shape inside its egg and I watched it on the ultrasound monitor. Velociraptor a small theropod native to China and Mongolia. We released the first raptor on April 22nd, 1985. Pack hunter, quite vicious and quite intelligent. 
It wandered back and forth near the wall for four minutes and 22 seconds before hearing a noise which drew it further off into the brush. The raptor padded in towards sundown. It drank nervously, careful of the dangers of the Jurassic waterhole. It preened itself utterly confident of its right to be there, absolutely no consciousness that it was not the sovereign ruler of this earth. Not all the original species survived, in the end only a few adjusted to the new world. These became dominant. Brachiosaur, the only true Jurassic native. One of the largest creatures ever to live. The Brachiosaur moved like planets among the smaller species. Tyrannosaurus rex, tyrant lizard. We grew seven of them, the seven rulers of the island. And despite what we'd been led to believe, the T-Rex was not a scavenger at all. We clocked one at 50 kilometers an hour. Triceratops, with the Tyrannosaur one of the last dinosaurs to live naturally on our planet. In the jungle, the forest and the mountain, three raptor tribes staked out territory. A third tribe of raptors took the mountain for their territory, a meaner, tougher man, quick, living on birds and tiny lizards. better so. Alone, fast and strong. The Albertosaurs took to the open fields like lions to the Serengeti, eking out a living between the seven Tyrannosaur and the three raptor tribes. Albertosaurs and seven T-Rex chose their dominions. Uneasy borders drawn around forests, ridges, and ponds. We tagged the most dangerous animals with radio collars that transmitted a warning signal, and workmen carried little boxes that played a tone when a tagged animal came near, at which point they would panic and flee in terror. By 1987, the first of them had reached full size. The ecosystem of another era began to reassert itself. Building the town was hard. Costa Rican contractors were competent people, but they had to be transported, fed, housed, and afterwards bound to silence. The biotechnicians were compensated for living in exile, high pay, luxury housing. Dennis wanted computer time and money. Henry wanted his state-of-the-art entertainments. These were the elite who could have gone anywhere to work. I had to keep them here. The power station was situated on the western coast. Residences were southeast and inland. A passcode let us control access to the valley and the power station beyond. The pylons ran for kilometers, one every hundred meters or so. 
Running east from the plant, they climbed the valley before descending south into the plains. Workers from the mainland were pouring concrete supports for a rail system running north to the settlement. Concrete towers rose through the jungle canopy. Curving up out of the southern basin, the Atherton Causeway would bring visiting scientists north from the southern beach. May 1989, we began laying foundations on the South Beach for a hotel for visiting scientists and businessmen. A year hence, I thought, the island would be quite famous. The southern beach looked out over trackless ocean, down past Peru all the way to Antarctica. The main harbor for Site B. the smells of salt water and gasoline. I'd planned that someday visitors, scientists and politicians would be welcome here. The docks were the lifeblood of Site B. Amber, synthetic eggshell and livestock came from all over the Pacific Rim. The Emily was a tug for bringing in the bigger freighters. Occasionally we took it out to observe specimens from offshore or to sweep the tide for traces of our operation. Far out to sea, we would sometimes glimpse the US Coast Guard units assigned to observe our activity. It was scuttled in 1989 as a quarantine measure soon after I gave the government my testimony. In 1989, the park was nearly complete. Our investors demanded on-site approval, and I, idiotically as it now turned out, believed we were ready. The debacle of August 27th, 1989 is now quite well known, and the legal consequences were, as you may well imagine, uh, rather extensive. I'm sure you've heard the rest of the story on the television news or in the tabloids. Bankruptcy. I leaned against the wall, my whole body shook. I dropped the mug, it shattered. I let it lie there. We would be leaving soon. When it became known that I was bankrupt, workers simply dropped their tools and walked away. Buildings were stripped of everything valuable, and we sealed off the town, save for a few crucial gates, southward to the lowlands, eastward to the power plant and laboratory. We sealed the eastern gate for the last time. Gazing from my study window, I hit on a simple mnemonic for the passcode. Like Nedry, I felt I needed to keep a back door open. As we left, we vandalized our own locking mechanisms. InGen tolerates no trespasses. Technicians and workmen crowded round the docks, fearing they might be left behind when the security ring collapsed. Armed guards stood watch. On that last day, I stood apart from the rest of them. The helicopters were setting down. Before me the jungle spread out, and I saw that a savage primal age had begun again. October 1996, the InGen Corporation is taken out of my hands by a vote of the Board of Directors. My nephew dispatches his team. 
hunting dinosaurs is quite a tricky business. I recommend helicopters, if you've got them. American-made tranquilizer darts. The effect changes with the target's body mass, temperament, and mood. I believe the phrase is, results may vary. The hunters landed on May 13, 1997, deep in the island's southwest. Most of them had worked at my African parks for years. They never stood a chance. The hunters scattered, their prearranged hunting routes forgotten. Only a third of their number appeared at the rendezvous. Martin A.S. still missing. Karamchetti V. still missing. Masal P. still missing. Sullivan R.M. still missing. Van Hall S.T. also still missing. I gave myself over to the strange, lonely discipline of the market, investment strategies and profit. I stood apart, master of codes and lost world. My work, my work lies where I left it. If there is anyone brave enough and clever enough to take it and return the keys to time, perhaps the foundation of a new empire. I can picture them moving cautiously through the dusty rooms in bulky biohazard gear, clutching rifles, pouring over our records, reading our files. As I write this, tiles are cracking, smeared with windblown dirt and animal tracks. Thick tree roots are pushing up through the asphalt. The island settles itself, beginning to erase all trace of us. Technology, the real trick of it, is still in there. In a darkened room, in an empty building with a dirty floor, it waits. The flashpoint. The origin of Jurassic Park.